Can you guys see my screen now? Everybody see the presentation here? All right, cool. All right, so all I'm gonna do is just kind of go through the background. Um, hopefully you guys have been looking at the videos I've been posting. Um, I'm really posting those to try to supplement uh, what you guys be missing if I was in class with you. And today I wanna go through World War II because there's so much information. Make sure you guys get as much as you can. Uh, this Nearpod, I will also make available to you guys after we get done, okay? If you guys got questions, let me know. Um, after every slide, I'm gonna pause for like maybe 10 seconds or so to make sure you guys got questions, you can answer them. If you have your Cornell notes out, um, you can guys go ahead and use those as well, just to help you with making sure you answer everything. And then I'll do a Q&A at the end in case you got some questions and we just try to wrap up no later than one o'clock, but also maybe a little bit earlier. Okay. All right, let's get rolling. All right, so we've already talked about the Great Depression. We've already talked about FDR. Um, and we also talked about the New Deal. So I'm keeping in mind you guys got that in the background. Does anybody have any questions about that though? Anybody got any questions about the New Deal or FDR or um, the Great Depression before we move into World War II? You can unmute yourself and ask any questions you may ask. Okay. Okay, let's keep moving then. All right, so let's get into FDR's policy. So um, a couple of things that FDR did is he had the good neighbor policy, which really was reinforcing the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Hope you guys remember that from earlier in the class. Remember, um, no European um, interference or anything here in the Western Hemisphere or the Americas. Uh, we also recognize the Soviet Union now, because remember after World War I, after they had the communist revolution, they became the Soviet Union. We now recognize them. We also had a series of neutrality acts that was passed. Um, the first one being in 1935, no arms, no travel, and also 1936, no loans, no credit. The America's First Committee was also established, and then Roosevelt gave in 1937 his quarantine speech talking about ca cash and carry. Remember, the whole idea about cash and carry is that if European nations wanted our help, what they had to do was literally give us money and then they had to come over to the American shores and get the goods and services that they actually bought. This was then modified in 1935. Okay, keep going. All right, so now we get into the Selective Services Act. Um, hopefully you guys remember what the Selective Services Act, that is nothing more than the American draft. It started in 1940. During peacetime, we had 1.2 million troops. Uh, the America First Committee and other isolations were distraught about this. Uh, we want to have an arsenal for democracy because we want to make sure we protect democracy. So we had, he also gave the four freedom, excuse me, four freedom speech. Must be fed, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of want, freedom of fear. We got to make sure we protect everything. Also, you had the Lend Lease Act in March of 1941. Um, Great Britain can purchase on credit, but public opinion wanted to support isolations. Again, we did not want to be in another world war. We knew the war was going on. It was also like, it's a very famous um, political picture where you have America and you have literally all of Europe burning. Um, you see that for both World War One and World War II. We really not want to be part of that. But on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor happened and then everything changed um, as we know it because then we jumped into the war immediately after that. Okay. I spoke about Pearl Harbor in my video lecture talking about um, the Korematsu case. Hope you guys did that. Um, AP students, I hope you really looked at that because I really broke down the whole Supreme Court case where I did a, I took the Supreme Court case and I did a brief, which is a condensed version of the case. So I was reading directly from the case. Um, but as you guys probably already know about Pearl Harbor, um, it was done in the Hawaiian Islands of Oahu. Right before 8 a.m., you had about 180 um, Japanese warplanes that sailed overhead. Most of the Pacific fleet was less, excuse me, was in an area less than three uh, square miles. You have roughly, these are rough estimates, about 2,400 Americans that were killed and about another roughly 1,200 wounded. You have about at least 300 warplanes, 18 warships sunk, 
Um, and then Japan lost maybe about 29 planes. So they were extremely efficient in this attack, and it was very well organized, and it really hurt the back of the United States as far as having a jumping off point, anything going in the Pacific. Because remember, when we annexed Hawaii some years back, one of the main reasons I was talking about is for the sugar plantations to what's going on with pineapples, but then also because now you have a center foot in Hawaii. Even to this day, if you're trying to go across the Pacific Ocean, leaving from the West Coast, California, like basically San Francisco far the South, you're going to have to make a stop in Hawaii just to refuel and to give a break because the whole Pacific Ocean is very large, very dense. If you try to go to Australia, anywhere in the Pacific, Hawaii is that jumping off point. Has anybody got any questions so far? You guys good? To see some of y'all faces. Hi, y'all. It's good to see y'all. I miss you. All right, let's get back into it. All right, so three days later, Germany and Italy declared war in the United States. Then Americans were part of no of another world conflict, and then their contributions would make the difference between victory and defeat of the Allies. So both in World War One and World War Two, the United States entry into the war really changed the dynamics of the war. Uh, some historians will argue that's the re main reason why, until 9/11 at least, there's no one really trying to go to war with the United States. If you can make an argument, 9/11 was still even a little bit different because everybody's still kind of afraid, if you will, of the American uh, manufacturing plants. Like, say, we live here in the Great Atlanta area. When you go downtown to Atlanta, the two things you see a lot of are lofts and you see a lot of railroads. That's going back to the idea where you can move um, cargo through those railroads, and you also have those factories. A lot of your lofts to this day is an old factory. So the, 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 if you look at it, the infrastructure is there to build as needed. Keep going. All right, so you got two sides. Some of these may look familiar from what we talked about World War One. You have Germany, Italy, and Japan, which is the Axis powers. And then you have the Allied powers being um, Great Britain, Soviet Union, also known as Russia, United States, and then governments in exile, like the Free to French. So remember, Germany was really taking over most of all of Europe. Italy was their supporting cast, and Japan was taking care of the uh, Pacific area. So these are your two sides of the war. You got a question? Put that mic on and go ahead and ask me. You guys good? And I'll make this near part available to you guys in the classroom later on when I post this video, actually. Okay, keep going. Here's somebody got their, make sure you cut your mics on mute before we don't have any background noise. All right, keep going. All right, we're not doing the Nearpod activities, so we're going to go right through this. All right, let's talk about World War II on the home front. Your presentation that you guys got to do with your Nearpod is going to kind of focus on this as well. So the first thing you got to do is war mobilization. Uh, war products, and again, we got the great arsenal of democracy. Remember, we talked about that earlier. That's one thing we try to protect. And that great arsenal includes planes, ammunition, and then also both, you can see I got the little, if you remember, American Online, AOL, the little shopping cart. I got kids here at home with me, so we make things kind of creative. All right, so the Office of Price Administration. So we got to ration everything, all right? Um, belt buckles are being rationed. Tires are being rationed. Food's being rationed. We are rationing everything um, because everything right now we need for the war effort. You also gonna have victory gardens. So we're now asking the Americans to go out and plant food in their gardens just so we can support and uh, help our troops. And then also war bonds. There's a very funny, if you guys can go Google it, and I'll try to post on Google Classroom later, uh, Bugs Bunny is like a minute and a three second uh, commercial, if you will, uh, where he's asking people to go buy war bonds. So again, buy war bonds, again, you're trying to help support um, the war effort. Uh, these are all things that we had in place during World War II. And these are all actual pictures that actually came from this time period. And even Captain America. Captain America was one of the biggest propaganda tools that they had and as used as comic books. So you got to think about what did Captain America stand for and also what did he fight against. I'm using that because he's also very popular in Marvel Comics as far as what we see in the movies to this day.
You guys good? Okay. Keep rolling. And we'll have a Q and A at the end, okay? All right. So now, I give you a second for y'all to look at this. Hopefully, this helps you guys remember things that's going on in the 1920s. Again, we're rationing everything. So you can't necessarily, so like think about this lady right here. Um, she's shaving her legs. We don't have razors like that, so we gotta find different ways to do things. And that, um, I, I gotta ask someone, I'm not positive, but I think, uh, you know how you got the um, ladies, y'all can probably help me out with this. I think it's called snare or something like that, where you it's like a um, cream you wipe on your body and it like takes the hair off. I think this got started back in the 1940s. I just got to go back and really look at it. Do any of you ladies know that? Can y'all help me out with this? Because I don't shave my legs like that. Y'all not helping me here. Yeah, that's what there. That's what I'm talking about. But yeah, we got, I got to look and see, find out when it got started. But again, I'm bringing it up because it kind of goes back to the idea that you have to ratchet everything. And you know, razors, like we all use razors for either shaving or like I use it when I shave my face. That has metal in it. You need that metal for things for the war effort. So that has to be rationed and people didn't have it no more. Okay. Whose little brother is that? Who, who, who is it? I want to see somebody's little brother. My kids are away. I go get them later when we get done now. That way I can see my little children. All right, let's keep going. All right, so now all of the war information was totally responsible for the idea of propaganda. Um, I'm going to send you guys some of these links to these videos so you guys can see them later on. Um, but you literally go type in World War II propaganda, you will see a slew of videos um, I'm going to post some on Google Classroom for you. So they're, they're literally cartoons that we watch every day. You never think twice about it to, unless you're studying World War II. So again, quiet, know your place, shut your face. Don't talk bad about the war effort at all. Let's keep everything moving, pop, pop, uh, focus and moving um, proper. Manhattan Project, make sure you guys, I know this is probably somewhere in your um, Cornell notes. This was in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Robert Oppenheimer, he was German. He's a German scientist. This is the first test of a nuclear war bomb was July 16th, 1945. And the, the, the story about the nuclear uh, weapons is that it originated in Germany, right? You had German scientists, you can make an argument if Hitler did not lose the uh, European front, they probably would have had the nuclear weapons first. But then there was a vacuum to break up Germany. And I think I might have this coming up later on. But the United States got the more of the scientific side. So we was able to then go ahead and get that information and to actually make nuclear warheads. Remember, that changed not only the world, but also changed how we have the um, World War II end as far as we get to Japan and things of that nature. But um, this first test of the nuclear um, warhead was in July, July 16th, 1945. If you think about 1945, it's not that long ago. There's people born in 1945 that's still alive to this day. So this whole thing we got going right now really started back then. Okay. So I do have a video, but because I'm using my um, headphones, I am not going to play this for you guys. But again, I'm going to post this um, near pop for you guys in Google Classroom. I think this is going to be the video going to talk about, yeah, um, Everything's going as far as propaganda. I'm gonna post this for you guys later. Remember, propaganda is literally anything as far as commercials. We see a lot of propaganda on t-shirts. Our t-shirts, you can say, is some level of propaganda as well. And then um, anything, this is one of the most funniest videos ever. Please make sure you guys watch this one um, with um, Donald Duck. And it's talking about just, it was just trying to give a play on what's going on in Germany. Okay, play it again because you guys won't be able to hear it. Here's some more of those propaganda pictures I was talking about. Syphilis and uh, gonorrhea. Um, it's kind of funny how they, not funny in a sense, but it's kind of interesting if you will, like how they play as far as imaging 
of individuals. Remember, the country still very much black and white. Um, you notice back here in the background, you have a more ethnic individual kind of looking to the side, working, where you guys have saying, basically, if you go and fight, you have this beautiful young woman that's going to want to be on your side. Um, you also got here, as far as the enemy is syphilis, so protecting yourself against that. Again, this is all propaganda to try to help the war effort. You can um, buy bonds at this time period, things of that nature as well. Hopefully you guys know who this is. This is Rosie D. Riveter, right? You got more real life of her, but this is one of the most famous uh, pictures. You guys will see this on every assessment you ever get. Uh, we can do it. You've seen different, very various parts of it because um, in World War II, because all the men was um, out to war, you have the women really holding it down. And this really kind of started pushing towards, um, they now, they remember they got the right to vote in the 1920s, but now you start getting the idea of they can go out and get jobs, they get as far as education. They had a women's only baseball league because it's like the way football is very popular to this day. Um, baseball is even more popular back then. So women really kind of leveled the playing field as far as how things were going on during World War II. Sadly, when they came back is when they said, okay, now you go back to the house. And then a lot of women fought against that. And now we have a society we have right now because of these ladies and their fights. All right, so now let's talk about some more of the ethnic um, individuals. You know, as you know, I love to talk about this. Um, so first talk about African-Americans or Black Americans. You had A. Philip Randolph. All right, so make sure you guys are listening to me on this one. Asa Philip Randolph, he actually was an um, African-American um, leader. He actually is the one that started two marches in Washington. The first march in Washington started back in World War I, if I'm not mistaken. And this is when you have Woodrow Wilson that basically signed executive order to stop it. Both his march on watches talk about equality for jobs. The second march on Washington is what we now know as where we get Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he was called by the Double V campaign. That's another one as far as trying to get more rights to um, black individuals. This right here is Asa Philip Randolph. Uh, you also had increased membership in NAACP and CORE. We'll get back into both of these two more in depth when we get into um, the civil rights movement, particularly core, because I want to make sure you guys have some more background on that. But uh, I'm sorry, this was actually doing the first uh, March on Washington was on World War II. I made a mistake there because uh, he threatened to do the March on Washington if they did not allow more um, African Americans to have jobs. And FDR passed executive order allowing that to happen. So that's the end discrimination. Then we have our Mexican Americans uh, allow barrios into the United States for harvest season, harvest season, harvest season. Um, formal immigration procedures. So what they had here is that um, they, particularly back in the Southwest, they allowed uh, a lot more of um, Mexican Americans to come in because they needed, again, they needed hands and need bodies to work. And this main place they needed them to work at was going to be on the um, the farms. Okay. You also had the Zoot Suit Riot. I think I spoke about that earlier in the class. Did I speak about that? Can anybody speak on that? Did I talk about the Zoot Suit Riot? Anybody? No? All right, well, I'm gonna just say it anyway. The Zoot Suit Riots um, happened June 3rd through 8th, 1943 in LA, uh, which is where you had American servicemen stationed in Southern California going against Mexican-American youths who are residents of the city. So again, this is another race ride, uh, kind of going to coincide with what we talked about earlier in the class with Chicago and also with Tulsa. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. You have basically about a little bit over 500 um, arrests, mostly Latinos being arrested. And again, this ended in 1943. You have roughly about 150 injuries as well. Uh, again, this is a riot, but you also can call it even to some degree a revolt. All right, give you guys a second. We already talked about Japanese Americans in Korematsu v. United States. I've made a whole post on that. We've already talked about women. Uh, Band of Brothers is a good movie. You guys can go watch, talk about wartime, so um, keep everybody together. American Indians, the Navajo Cold Talkers. Very good video on that. Give you guys a second. For my AP students, this is a lot of good information for you guys to have. Uh, just as a sidebar, um, I know we are out right now because of the virus. There's a lot of talks. I'm not posting until I have a lot more um, concrete information, but it looks like the AP exam is still going to happen. 
So I'll just keep more information as it comes to me and let you guys know. All right, so the um, Cold Talkers was a person employed by the military during wartime to utilize a little known language as a means of secret communication. So these individuals basically was a way to communicate things that other people may not normally know because there's a language a lot of people didn't know. So that's how they use a lot of our American Indians. And again, Band of, Sol Band of Brothers, rather, is a pretty good movie you guys can go watch. All right. This kind of goes back to, uh, we'll talk about the court mafia case. Again, go look at that presentation that I posted. Not the presentation, but the video I posted because I really went in detail about the court mafia case. Um, this young man right here, he actually was, a, he's a very famous actor um, and also a advocate for, um, excuse me, gender rights and homosexuality. And he actually was part of the Japanese um, American group that was actually part of these internment camps. Um, I'll post here this TED talk for you guys to watch it later on where you guys hear his story. Um, but he's most famously known for being an actor on Star Trek. And this actually might be the video in this Nearpod and I'll post that for you guys. Yeah, this is the video. So I'll post it for you guys later on today. All right, so I'm going to really kind of skip through um, the Japanese American portion, only for the fact I did that in a video lecture that I posted yesterday. And remember, in 1988, they did get a formal apology, and each person that was still alive, that was a third, they got reparations in the form of $20,000. All right, here's a good quote from Ace of Philip Randolph. Salvation for a race, nation or a class must come from within. Freedom is never granted, it is just it is won. Justice is never given, it is exacted, and the struggle must be continuous for freedom is never a fine, final fact, but a continually evolving process to higher and higher levels of human, social, economic, political, and religious relationships. And uh, excuse me, um, Ace of Philip Randolph or Ace Philip Randolph was a civil rights leader. He's one of your first ones. And again, he gave the platform for Martin Luther King to give his I Have a Dream speech that we study so much in school already. All right, so I'm gonna make sure I have this on my blog, but it should be already up. I have a whole blog page that's dedicated to Ace of Philip Randolph. Please make sure you guys go look at that because you guys gotta make sure you guys know about him. Let's talk about the battlefront. Okay, so I'm going through all the battles for you guys to have a background at. So I'm gonna go look look at you guys. Y'all still with me? I see everybody's muted. All right, y'all ready for these battles? Now, this may not be in your Cornell notes. Put this on the back. No matter what, make sure you guys know these battles. They always come back up. I have always seen tests come up with battles, and you got to make sure you guys know these, all right? So I'm going to go through these. Make sure you guys write them down. If it's in your Cornell notes, because I honestly don't remember it, write it. Let's not put them on the back. Let's make sure you guys have this as background information. Let's get rocking. All right, so major battle timeline, 1940, June. Um, this is you have the Lusa, Lusa wife. I can't say the word, I'm sorry. Um, but this is where you had the Germans on uh, the Battle of London, 57 straight nights of bombing. This is just a bombing campaign. Of course, December 7 was Pearl Harbor. Then on April 18th, you had the Doolittle Raid, bombing of Tokyo by US Corps. If you go watch the movie Pearl Harbor, the end, the last battle is deals with the Doolittle Raid, okay? Um, then on June 4th, you had the Battle for Midway. This is the turning point of the Pacific War. So United States actually wins its first sea battle with Japan. Japan is important to understand is they never gave up. You understand? Like they was going to keep fighting until the last man was dead, until like everybody was dead. It took the atomic bomb, the threat of a third one for them to actually give up. Like they were not going to quit. June 30th is when German troops uh, surrendered at Stalingrad in Russia. Then on D-Day, this was, um, this is when you guys look, I think it's, um, Call of Duty, I'm looking at my video game. Call of Duty World War II, the game starts off on D-Day. Three million soldiers storm Normandy, France, and overtake Germans. So you want to get a good visual of that, go play Call of Duty World War II. Uh, so make sure your parents say it's okay first. 
because I'm not getting in trouble for that. All right. Everyone need a gas mask. Remember, um, you have um, mustard gas being importantly um, used and displayed during World War One. And this picture here, these pictures really kind of tell the whole story where you have kids that are in gas masks. That's how serious it was. Um, when the world goes to war, um, the United States has been pretty lucky to some degree to where we haven't had any battles here on our home front. So we always kind of been away looking at the war being afar, but war is deadly and it's really bad. Continue with our timeline. So the Battle of the Bulls, U.S. loses 35,000 soldiers trying to defend Belgium City. This happened in 1944. Then we go over to 1945, Iwo Jima. The U.S. Marines overtake the island just 70, 150 miles from Tokyo. The Battle of Berlin was huge on April 16, 1945, when the Soviets captured Berlin as Nazis, Nazis fight to death. Then on August 5th, you got the first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. 70,000 people died. August 8th, the second uh, atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. 30,000 people died. And this is mean, again, these are rough estimates. These are the numbers that we say people died immediately, but people even live with lasting effects into the 2000s. It was just dying of slow deaths due to radiation of the nuclear blast. So these are people that maybe die instantly, but they also mean, we, you got to keep in mind, uh, when these bombs dropped, the hot, heat was so bad to where the people just evaporated. So these are all rough estimates. I would argue these numbers are probably a lot higher. All right, D-Day, um, June 6th, 1944. Operation Overlord, that's the name of the operation. Uh, it was led by Eisenhower. The first wave has high casualties. Uh, the idea was to liberate France. He wanted to get France away from Germany. Um, it was a very ambitious attack, over 2 billion troops. Um, I'll post a good video for you guys to watch over this too. But we ended up with it winning at very high cost though. I'm gonna post this near for you guys. You do not need to do any notes off of it. I'll just post for you guys to review it and you guys can use the um, videos. All right, Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. Y'all with me? This happened on May 8th, 1945. After the bulge, Allies closed in on Berlin, and then Allies met at Yalta to discuss terms of German surrender. Berlin ended up under Soviet control. Hitler committed, excuse me, he um, committed suicide at the beginning of May 1945, um, before as uh, everybody was coming in to take Berlin. Then, then this is when you also had discovery of the quote death camp. So once they got into Berlin, they really saw how bad the Holocaust was, and they saw these death camps. And there's no way to say this, but it was a very sad time in our history, as far as world history. And you guys could see that from uh, the Band of Brothers. They actually got a scene there. All right, so here you got a U.S. soldier replacing Adolf Hitler sign with Roosevelt sign. And it's always a good question. Like, what if Hitler did not lose? Like, what would the world be like? Again, they had nuclear technology already. They was fortifying it. They had some of the best minds as far as technology. What would have happened if Hitler did not lose? Like, it's, it's a crazy question to think about. And I always like to quote um, something I, I learned growing up from comic books that every villain sees himself as being a hero in his own eyes. So you got to keep that in mind, too. And you look at Hitler, too. Remember, and we're going it's a video that I'm gonna give you guys next week because um we're gonna be a little bit ahead of our material. But um after World War One, Germany was really kind of left in ruins and blamed for everything. Hitler came up and he kind of uplifted his people, gave them something to fight for. And that's why you can say a lot of people actually followed. Not everybody followed Hitler, but a lot of people did because he actually gave them a purpose. Because again, the rest of the world kind of um pushed them to the side saying, Is y'all fault we had World War One? And then look what happened. All right, so now we talk about the Pacific. So there's a good map. Hope you guys have been looking at it. Uh, the Marshall Islands, talk about the Samoan Islands, here's Australia, here's Japan. The idea what the United States is trying to do is move up and through the Pacific to get up to Japan. Okay? That was the whole idea. All right, so now get into the Pacific battles. Battle of Midway was the turning point to stop the Japanese expansion. Then the United States started doing island hopping. 
there are thousands of islands over in the Pacific. Not all people live on them, but it's just a lot of different islands. So the United States is trying to get closer and closer to um, Japan. Japan then conquers the Philippines. And um, General Douglas MacArthur says, I shall return because he lost that battle. And then we made it up with the Battle of Iwo Jima. Japan would never give up. Even though they lost the battle, they would never give up. The Battle of um, Okinawa, if you guys ever go watch um, the Karate Kid Part 2, the older one, he actually talks about Okinawa. They actually are there. This is when you have kamikaze starting to uh, come into play, where you literally just have suicide bombers and fighters where they were just fighting no matter what. Now, the atomic bombs was uh, to help try to avoid an invasion. Truman warned Japan of utter destruction if they did not surrender. So again, we, we uh, dropped the, the bombs on both um, Hiroshima on August 6th, also Nagasaki on August 9th. But I want you guys to also pay attention, look at these pictures. Look at how we vid and view them. There's a lot of racial stereotypes here. And you can't ignore it, and it's there. Well, well, seems to be a slight shifting in the Japanese current. So you got to look at that. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys for sticking with me. Does anybody got any questions right now? Y'all good? Finish this up. My computer screen just froze on me. What happened? No. Okay, let's get off of cop. All right, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and stop that. So that is the really the gist of everything that's going on as far as what we have there. Does anybody got any questions? Go ahead and open up for Q and A right now. Anybody got any questions on anything we talked about? Anything you guys see in your Cornell notes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Battle of the Atlantic. All right, so the Battle of the Atlantic, that goes back into just, oh, that was a good battle. So I wish I had a map I could show you. So you think about the east coast of the United States. You actually had small little battles that was going on throughout the whole uh, Caribbean, going all the way back into Europe because you had submarines. And what they was afraid of is that the United States still shipping over goods and ammunition to Europe. So that was the Battle of the Atlantic where you actually had little skirmishes throughout the whole Atlantic uh, basin. You did not have nearly as much over in the Pacific because it's just too big. But the Atlantic is considerably smaller and it's really just um landlocked if you look between the European continent and then what's going on here. They even went as far south as the land of, of um, Africa and even to South America. So in the presentation I gave you guys, um, that kind of goes more detail, but that's in a nutshell what it is. Other questions? Any other questions, folks? The Manhattan Project, that was the um, process. That's where the United States tested the atomic bombs in Los Alamos, Mexico. Abraheimer, I can't say I can't say his name clearly, but it's the German scientists that we got. But that's where we uh, was testing um, the nuclear bombs that eventually was being used against Japan. Other questions? Okay. All right, so one thing else I wanna to add to it too, uh, VJ Day, that was Victory in Japan Day. So that's when, the, that was officially the end of World War II. After all those battles, after, and what happened is after the last, um, what was the last bombing in uh, Japan? And, Nagasaki, 
the United States gave Japan another option. They actually did surrender. But what they did is maintain they had the emperor in place. And you had General MacArthur that went in and um, basically made, honest to God, Japan like a little mini United States. I'm um, going to show you guys some more stuff to help you guys out with that. Uh, this is the last part, and then we're going to be done. And again, if you got questions, let me know. Let me share the screen with you guys again. So the aftermath of the top of bombs, I want to go more into that real quick. Um, what typically happens is that you have a really bright white flash that occurs that you cannot see. And then you have black rain because you have the, all the residue coming from the bomb. Um, you also have, this is, now, this is crazy, y'all. This is a drink bottle. Look at how deformed it is, right? This is how hot it was. Um, this right here, if I'm not mistaken, this is glass that's been deformed. It was so hot to where it's like this lump of small glass bottles was dug up in the ruins of a, of an ink factory. This is how hot. They basically were fused all together by lumps of fire. Kind of want to give you guys a visual. This is um fused lumps of old coins that are together now, exposed to the high heat of the fire coming from the atomic um weapon. And now this is the crazy part. This is a white wall stained by the black rain that came as so then as the um when the bomb goes off, you get the cloud, and that cloud has condensation that comes out, and that becomes black rain. That black rain is acid, that can kill you. Okay. It's very much radioactive. And then this is the um, wall that has the residue of that as well. Burned out letters um, from the heat rays. There's a more, again, this is all, all the primary documents is a poster. This is like a burnout, like how hot it was. It was able to burn letters, like say I have something right here in my hands. The screen then is gonna be the paper. It was so hot that way it burned through that um, screen. Man, now and then this is the one I want to read to the shadow. Take a second read. Look at this. You can see the shadow of the human that died. The person was sitting on the on the bank steps waiting for it to open. Was exposed to the full flash of the atomic bomb explosion, receiving rays directly from the front, and the victim um, definitely died on the spot from massive burns. The surface on the surrounding stone step was turned whitish by the intense heat rays. The place where the person was sitting remain dark like a shadow. He was only about 260 meters from the uh, hypocenter, which is not that far away. This is done in Hiroshima. Um, I'm gonna post this right here where you guys can do a blast. Um, this is pretty cool. So where you can pick anywhere in the United States and you literally gonna say, okay, what happens if you have this kind of stuff that happens as far as wind, and then how large you want your bomb, you want to be like Nagasaki, Hiroshima, the little boy or, or a fat boy, and you can just drop the bomb and see what happens, how many people will die. Um, students always do it based off of Pembroke and see, okay, would I be safe if I lived in Atlanta, if I lived here in Dallas and places like that. So it's just a simulation. I'm going to post this. I would definitely say play around with this and see, like, would you live? All right, you had a lot of wartime conferences. Uh, the Tehran Conference in 1943 is where you had the big three. It's important to understand that Roosevelt, look how old Roosevelt is looking here. He did eventually die, and that's why we got Truman coming in to the post down. So this is before the war, and then this right here is after the war. And the idea was talking about how they're going to divide up Germany. And this is how we got kind of lucky if I get in the nuclear war head. So the first big three is where you have um, FDR, Stalin, and Churchill. The second big three after the war was over, you still got Stalin, you have Truman, and you have Italy. Europe, United States, uh, Soviet Union. I have to take that one through. All right, these are the numbers of people that died. World War I, World War II killed thousands and thousands of people. These are all rough estimates. The numbers are a lot higher, particularly here in Japan, because people kept dying even after the nuclear bombs were um that's detonated. People are still dying to this day from that. All right, y'all. That is all I got for you. Uh, one more again. Any kind of questions, any kind of concerns? Was this helpful? Do you guys want me to do this again? Give me some feedback.
Cool. That's the idea. Anybody else? 